Okay, so it's time to get to the pitch portion of today. In just a moment, you'll be hearing from people in this room who will be pitching their future scenarios for learning in the world in the year 2039. So that's 20 years from now, the span of an entire generation. What will our next generation's experiences be? How many of you have had a chance to get into our online community and explore some of the future scenarios that your colleagues put in there? A few of you. So if you go to the Shaping EDU website, which is shapingedu.asu.edu, um, there's a tab called Online Community. It'll launch you in our online community, whether you've registered there or not. Uh, you'll be able to go into the forum and read everyone's future scenarios for 2039. So I'm going to invite some colleagues to kind of pitch a selection of those scenarios. And what's going to happen is these um, fellow dreamers, doers, and drivers are going to compel you to join their neighborhood working sessions to help them achieve their utopia. And in these neighborhood working sessions, you're going to be focused on strategy. How are we going to achieve the utopia? What do we need to do? What's our framework? What's our approach? And then you're going to be thinking, what do we need to create to achieve that utopia? What are some outputs? So again, in your little shaping EDU folders or packets, you would just have a couple sample frameworks to get you started in terms of strategy. Then, of course, you have a whole slew of different types of outputs you could be thinking of, including ones that maybe haven't even been invented yet. So be thinking of that in the back of your mind uh, while you, we hear from some of our uh, future scenario pitchers. So um, I'm going to invite not only the people pitching, but the people who are next on deck. If I invite you on deck, just have a seat on these chairs, and that will sort of reduce some of the back and forth. Uh, so on deck, um, I'm going to invite up Emery, Maya, and Christiana. And uh, currently pitching, I'm going to invite up Garvey Pike and Nancy Rubin. All right. So the idea of Tomorrowland is almost a, if you've ever been to Disney World, you've seen Tomorrowland was yesterday's vision of the future. You know, Jules Verne type thing, steampunk and all that, you know. So a lot of the ideas that we have or are just now starting to talk about or implement are not new ideas. We have so many great ideas from the past that if we just actually did them from the current and from the past, we really truly did these things, that would get us to utopia. So for example, how do we view learning? Is it expertise over credentials, right? That there could be meaningful ways to stack micro-credentials that would show that you know how to do something. That critical thinking, communication skills are truly taught and not just given lip service. That, and some of the ideas we heard up on the stage, having individualized programs of studies where we reduce sort of the gen ed requirements and have students take more agency in their learning, that we emphasize mastery learning, that we can unbundle and open up educational content, uh, faculty lead change through their collective ability instead of selling it away to textbook publishers and everyone else, and that instead of trying to just tick off boxes that, you know, we've achieved this metric, that authentic and actual transformation would happen. So the dystopian version of that is all of those things, but slightly twisted like we do in our late stage capitalism. Um, that sure, expertise is so highly valued that ETS marches right in and has a way to assess it and sell it right back to you. Same thing with micro-credentials, that we could just commodify everything. Um, critical thinking, sure, that's important, but let's make sure we check it off on an OpScan test. Um, gen Ed, we just keep stacking and stacking and making Gen Ed an endless stream of, you know, this is what everybody needs to know. Um, continuing Ed is just a huge money maker. It just continues to go that way rather than helping people upskill and reskill and change over their lives. It's just a huge business operation for the university. Um, sure, we can unbundle content, but now the publishers are going to want to sell it back to us, you know, per word. Um, so careful what you wish for type of stuff. Um, and 
we just accelerate checkbox thinking because we have so many things we need to accomplish. That's it. Thank you. All right, so on deck, we have um, Michael Berman and Megan Linos, and you're up, Christiana, Emery, and Maya. Welcome to 2039. Immersive experiences and immersive learning is everywhere. We access them to lightweight, Wi-Fi enabled, um, wireless energy glasses that uh, we use throughout the day. Uh, communities and countries throughout the world have access to those glasses as well, and we can all uh, work together to collaboratively solve the world's problems. Learning spaces have evolved into experiential lab and experiential centers where, where actually learners from all ages come to collaborate. Um, the relationship between students and teachers has dramatically changed in that the teachers are no longer teachers, they're just mentors. Um, coaching students into healthy relationships, healthy self-esteem, and uh, healthy um, active participation. It's a place where communities come together to, um, to think about the future and how we best um, protect and uh, have our, you know, care for our planet. There are no diplomas, there are no grades, only blockchain certificates that can build on stackables um, throughout uh, the learner's journey and their lifetime. Uh, the few faculty that s still see themselves as faculty are independent scholars. They come and in engage with, um, with learners in throughout the centers and um, are generously uh, being supported by philanthropic and industry uh, research, um, tr trying to you know, envision the next. Um, virtual tutors reside in your home, they're everywhere, they know you from the very first um, you know, time you enter your playground, they understand you, they coach you, um, they're emotionally there for you to support you to stretch your ability to learn. Um, and uh, it's no longer about Alexa, that's actually quite outdated. Uh, in 2039, we have uh, virtual tutors that are everywhere, constantly present in our life. Well, you've covered everything, but the mo main thing is that learning is meaningful and it has it's an experience that makes sense to the students and then passing it on quickly to the dystopian. <laughs> okay, come on guys, embrace your inner dystopia. This is fun, okay? If XR and AI could change e uh, education, it could just as easily destroy it. Think about how it could lead to a lack of access, resources, opportunity, and freedom. In this dystopian world, top-tier institutions provide students with virtual tutors and avatars. Other students are stuck in overcrowded classrooms. In education and in daily life, eye-tracking technology analyzes your emotions and your peripheral personal preferences, artificial intelligence knows what you want even before you do. There is no digital fluency in this world as Michael Madry has argued. In the future, any amateur user will be able to generate an avatar that looks like anyone on earth or anyone who has ever lived and animate that avatar to say anything they want. Truth and authenticity have disappeared, preserved only by the few homeless artists that live with the homeless hand jugs in the shanty towns. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one aspect of dystopia that is critical. Students and others are essentially happy in this. They don't realize it's a dystopia. M. Night Shyamalan himself could not have come up with a better plot twist. <laughs> Woo. All right, so on deck we have uh, Kim and Mark. And up we got Michael and Megan. Okay, so sometimes we tell stories of utopia and dystopia because we need to prepare for events that we can't control. But unlike some of the stories you will hear today, the people in this room can make a difference in how the story ends. I want us to think about how we insist, demand, that we keep the human connection front and center in higher education as we move quickly to a world where the dominant mode of instruction is online and at a distance. To make this happen, we have to ensure that institutional and political leaders understand and support the essential role of meaningful human interaction in the learning process. We need to apply artificial intelligence and other algorithmic strategies thoughtfully and scrutinize them for bias with constant oversight and shaping by human hands. 
Students should never feel they are learning from machines because there are thoughtful, sympathetic, and well-trained experts. Today we call them teachers, with whom they maintain constant communication and connection. In addition, we need to incorporate student-to-student -student interaction and connection into the learning journey. An ethic of humanized learning ensures that every student has the opportunity to achieve their potential, especially those who start with the greatest disadvantages. As institutions, teachers, and students get progressively more adept with learning in the online space, we know that an ever greater proportion of learning will be online at a distance, mediated by technology, but we need to strive for the right balance of computer and human interaction and provide the guidance of caring teachers throughout the journey. Here's the utopian vision. Over time, the student becomes the learner and the learner becomes a teacher, with each human maintaining agency in their educational journey over a lifetime. And if we don't, humanized learning will be a buzzword but represent a world that's anything but human. The default learning interaction for students will be based on a shallow conception of artificial intelligence, typically touted as personalized, but reinforcing social, social, cultural, and economic boundaries. The shrinking class of those who can afford it will opt out of the teaching machine for themselves and their children, choosing instead to use highly trained human teachers and mentors. Everyone else will be shunted to a dull machine-delivered curriculum focused mostly on the short-term needs of employers and the profit motives of providers. Human interaction, when available, will be typically provided by poorly paid customer service representatives who are trained primarily in how to get students to sign up and continue to pay for instruction regardless of quality. And students who fail to thrive in the system will be blamed for their failure, attributed to a lack of intelligence, grit, or character. The people in this room represent a significant force for keeping humanity and learning. Let us take up this challenge and assure we build the world we would want for all our children. Thank you. That is a utopia I could get behind. Um, so just to let you know, on deck we have uh, Stephen, Roshni, and Tom. And over to you, Kim and Mark. All right, great, thank you. All right, so we are gonna break free to learn. We are gonna bust through all of the restrictions uh, around us. And let me grab my slides. So the utopia, the utopia is really my dream for sure, and that is where there are radically new, different forms of school emerging. They're evolving, they're coalescing, and they're completely disappearing. And uh, education is a right. It's affordable, if not free. Um, we think about what the different purposes of education are. Maybe they're to get a job, but maybe they're to become more self and fully developed, become self-actualized, you name it. We've got it in there. And what we're talking about is from pre-K all the way through the end of life. These models support us all the way through. And we're not just higher ed. We can't just change to higher ed, right, in, in and of itself. So we've got, in, in that model, just like our student panel, we've got intergenerational leadership. We've got people teaching us, and we've got our elders who are also bringing the wisdom to bear on all this crazy data and automation that we've got around us. There is no place for surveillance technology. All right, there is no rigid time frames and schedules and standards. We've really got to be able to adapt. The dystopia. The dystopia is we do nothing. We are static. Only the wealthiest among us can have a truly engaged education. The rest of us are just going, sitting in our seats, doing our seat time, lockdown, data, um, outcomes, all of this. And the, the challenge is, as automation changes the world that we live in, the scope, scale, and velocity, that we will see happening as a result of machine learning, data in the cloud, and automation really demands that we're more creative as a society, and yet we don't have those people to help us. So I will finish up. If you haven't read this book, this is one of my all-time favorite books by Bob Johansson for the Institute for the Future. He identifies three global trends that are truly going to destabilize, in his opinion, uh, what we're doing, and that is climate change, pandemics, and um, cyber terrorism. And so if you think about the world and the things that these changes could contain for all of us, how do we respond as uh, institutions and as idealists? Everything that can be distributed will be. So what will we look like? Thank you. Come to your neighborhood. Oh, come to the <laughs> fostering intergenerational leadership across all sections of learning. Woo! Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you so much. And you'll see some of our volunteer mayors have just been so wonderful in terms of helping to co-facilitate and put this together. Thank you so much. I'm already super stressed because I want, already want to join all the neighborhoods already. It's crazy. Um, really quick note on deck uh, is Brian Yonke, and I'm going to toss it over to you, Tom Roshney and Steven. Okay, so uh, what we're talking about in our uh, utopia and dystopia is assessment and grading. This is probably evident if you uh, look to the screen. You can see here a uh, something that is probably pretty evident to you guys. This is a report card, right? Um, if you look at the grades, this is like from 1930. It should be pretty obvious that this person is kind of okay, kind of mediocre. Uh, in this, uh, they actually got some special attention compared to, I think, a lot of students. They have some narrative comments. Jack's not doing well in certain things. Not so great in Latin. Uh, but I don't think there's anything here that actually talks about the, the assessment strategies for saying if someone's going to be like, a nationally recognized hero, perhaps inspire an entire generation to go to space. Do you guys see whose report card this is? Okay, this is uh, John F. Kennedy's eighth grade report card. And um, the fact that we're approaching 100 years from when this was issued, 1930, uh, we are still finding this to be pretty much exactly what I would get as a PhD student when I log online to look at my grades. Our dystopia is a lot like the past. So I wrote a fairly flippant uh, narrative dystopia, if you go to Shaping EDU. Uh, the dystopia, which is here, is that uh, it's a parent, it's a father who's saying, I'm very uh, disappointed that my daughter is only getting a 7.75 uh, GPA score, uh, and he's going to complain to the teacher because uh, because his daughter is getting an A plus plus, not an A plus plus plus. Anyway, so the point is, the dystopia here is an extraordinary focus on uh, what we've been doing, grades, rote memorization, uh, lots of things you've heard uh, about in uh, in these other uh, 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 dystopias. Uh, in the utopian scenario for the uh, 20 years. Uh, I'm going to quote, uh, Ruben already quoted William Gibson, but I'll say, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, this is a picture here of a school. It's actually a 6th through 12th grade school outside of uh, Boston. It's in Cambridge called New View, where there are no grades, there are no classes. It is entirely project-based, and all of the students' work is assessed and documented collaboratively with experts through a digital online portfolio. Okay? I'm not saying this is the only way, and we're not certainly saying that we have all the answers about what the future of assessment and grading is like. But if you look at the students in this picture, uh, they're not sitting in rows, but I bet they look engaged. They certainly look engaged with people and with technology. So Roshni is going to bring us back down to earth. So join our uh, neighborhood working group if you are interested in finding ways to flexibly grade and evaluate students, having evaluations be more of just sort of progress reports rather than a do or die, you must get this grade or you will not achieve the next step in life, whatever that may be for you. Uh, keeping in mind how we don't want to put undue uh, stress uh, and pressure on instructors, but also providing some guidance to students so they know how they can improve and what that looks like for them. And also keeping in mind that across disciplines, this might look very different. Failure to join this group will negatively affect your assessment for this event. <laughs> So good. Uh, before we hear from Brian and Jeff and Natalie, you're on deck. And over to you, Brian, to talk about the modern adult learner. Oh, real quick, how, how come everyone else has a cohort that comes up? It's just me, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> apparently. So uh, r real quick, I want to talk a little bit about how I came to this thing that I wrote that I did not know I'd be up here talking about. Um, it was literally one morning. I was sitting down. It was quiet. My kids were not in the house. And I was literally eating a bowl of Cheerios. And I knew I had to write this thing. And um, my um, th th a couple things that my research kind of came into my head on what I wanted to talk about. For one is I travel, for my job, I travel all over college campuses. And I've been about to about three dozen college campuses in the last year. So I hear a lot. Um, in addition to that, I teach a class. And one of the projects in my class, it's in structural design class, structural technology class, one of the projects in my class is my students have to um, create a video around what they think the future of education is going to be like. And I give them the option of being 20 years. So I'm like, this is perfect. I'll use my student's project as, as some influence. And then right at the same time, my brother messaged me to say he's finally started reading Ready Player One. And so 
all that was what is in my head, and I'm now going to read what came out of my head after that morning where it was actually quiet and I got a chance to write something. In 2039, premier brick-and-mortar institutions become shrines of the past and enablers for the well-off. Only the smartest and wealthiest are privileged to participate in a combination of old and new strategies for education. Traditions have been upheld and enforced. Students sit in large lecture halls while the optimization of the latest and greatest technology expedites their quest for knowledge and network. The largest, most powerful entities in business and government pluck from these schools. Mid-level institutions and the smaller FTE liberal colleges have become defunct after fallen victim to the high costs that have inflated education. Community colleges, now extremely expensive as funding has dwindled, have thrived by embracing CBE models and by preparing their students for industrial, vocational, and the mundane service level positions. The top students find modest success at a blue collar peak. Or the top students find modest success at a peak, at a blue collar peak. Community colleges have become mostly online as the challenges to keep the physical infrastructure safe has failed. The gap between the have and have nots have further increased. That leaves the rest, the vast majority, on their own to build their quest, their pathway to survival and success. Thankfully, the online learning infrastructure that was rooted in the early 2000s has spiderwebbed into a new normal. Normal as most students, not protected from the barriers both physical and social, see this as the expectation. The emergence has slowly proven to be a benefit that, while not looked at as a threat by the traditionalists, has enabled a mass to build an alternative partly stemmed from the massive VR network and social movement. Learners embrace resources, both formal and informal, that they use to build their base on their way to evolving and innovating. This pathway to success is circumventing the traditional and establishing a new influence challenging tradition. I don't know if that's a, a dystopian or a utopian, it's just a topia, and hopefully we can just talk about that. So that's, that's my, what is it, neighborhood? That's my neighborhood. I heard Topia is a new beige, so it's totally neutral. <laughs> Sorry, I watch a lot of HGTV. <sighs> All right, on deck we have the Penn State contingency. And up now we got Jeff and Natalie. Thanks. Um, the early internet was characterized by a sort of a sharing economy, a commons, a lot of collaboration. And a lot of those impulses have grown and evolved and matured rather beautifully into the open educational uh, ecosystem that we have today. And at the same time, we have uh, extractive profiteering. We have the Facebook nightmare. And, um, and so I want to propose that if we begin with the premise that open and the commons constitute an operating system under which uh, all, of the, all of the other kinds of innovations that we can move toward might hinge. So whether we're talking about um, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, whether we're talking about adaptive learning, um, whether we're talking about student as producer ethos, all of those things stemming from the operating system of the commons as opposed to extractive, centralized profiteering. That's what we're going to uh, try to tease out in our group and, and move forward with. And I'm going to, uh, Natalie's going to give you some more. I figured I'd do the energetic part of the end, right? Um, so yeah, we're going to be investing in open. How is open going to affect our future? You know, is it going to affect it negatively or positively? And how? I had slides for all this kind of thing. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess I, the font didn't transfer over. Oops. Um, I made slides, but they weren't quite uh, Geo's, uh, Geo's thoughts exactly, but they're pretty similar to what I'm thinking as well. So I kind of wanted to go off the idea that open educational resources are commonly used, um, how open scholarships and open pedagogy can essentially help education in the long run. I'm really sorry for the wordiness. It looked prettier when I had it, when I made it. Um, and... Um, just kind of this whole idea of how open is going to go. And the dystopian would be that students essentially 
go further into debt. Things just continue to get worse. Um, things aren't open anymore. You can't access materials, and you continue to pay more for things. And essentially, I have this idea that the workforce will just start hiring out of high school so they can teach their own people instead of hiring college grads because they're not even learning anything anyway. So that's my dystopian. It's pretty negative. I can see it being realistic in some ways. Kind of sad. And the question of, are we already on this path? You know. So I'm really excited about open education and just open things in general. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and see how we can take this into the, the now. You know. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I'm going to invite Paul Signorelli up on deck. Let's hear from Kyle, Carly, and Jennifer. Thank you. So uh, digital assistants are not a new idea. Many of us uh, encounter them on a near daily basis. And they take many flavors. Sometimes they're that little device like Alexa or Google Home that sits in our house and plays our favorite music or turns on the Christmas tree. Or maybe something more like the autocorrect on your phone that makes sure that you're always sending double entendres to your mom. <laughs> These are the types of devices, though, that we assign just tasks to. But imagine a future where it's not just tasks, but that assistant is a creative partner. Right, helping you to achieve new ideas, to take on complex problems, to look at things in ways that you may not have seen before. To explore this, let's have Jennifer talk about this from a faculty perspective. So thanks, everybody. My digital assistant has driven me to school. So while I was um, on my way to work, I'm not actually driving, but I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing with my students today. Um, as my students walk in, my digital assistant is whispering in my ear the student's name, a little bit of their background information. So that which makes, which makes me the most human, that connection with my student is augmented because I now have all of this not in the far back of my brain, but readily available. Um, my AI assistant provides me with materials for the courses, questions that I might want to ask, and some basic grading um, function. And this leaves me with the opportunity to do what makes me most human, again, connecting with my students uh, and making that um, personal growth for them part of what we're talking about every day. So I'll give a student perspective to this. Um, for me, Mom, this device would help as, a, as us as students do tasks that we don't really need to do, add things to our calendar, um, send emails, things that take up our daily life that get, really take away the opportunity to dive deep into the curriculum that we're given. So by having these devices, I would be able to now um, not have to worry about the procedure of what I'm doing, but instead worry about conceptually understanding all of the things that I'm told to learn so I can dive deeper and learn more complex than what we typically do. So on the dystopian side, we can explore the many negative aspects of this. And so does this create then a de facto surveillance state? Right, that looks less like the Star Trek computer and more like a creepy version of Elf on the Shelf. That are we doomed for a counterculture future of hipster anti-AI artwork, right? Creating neck-bearded uh, AI ar free artisanal art. Uh, or are we bound uh, for a future where intellectual property is ingested because it's part of the creation process. And then that becomes a mechanism to deliver student-centered services, things like plagiarism detection that we see today. Again, let's take a look at it from different perspectives, though. So I'm a very sad, unemployed ex-faculty member. The assistant has taken over my job. And it is done so in such a way that it is such a low cost um, a way for um, this material to be delivered that all institutions have the same IS AI assistance teaching everybody. So there's no diversity in thought. There's no diversity in skills. There's no diversity in approaches to the work that we're doing. Everybody is ga graduating looking like um, a, a human version of Wally. The personal assistant reports on decisions about who should continue in their studies and who should join me, the former unemployed faculty member at the rock quarry. Uh, from a student perspective, uh, these assistants are going to now track us K-12, to so they will know when we mess up, when we struggle, when we're not passing what we're supposed to, and they put us on tracks that we shouldn't be on, and they really limit where we can go and the educational opportunities that we have. Join me in the rock quarry. <laughs> So as you can see, there's a complex problem. Please join us for our session as we explore the idea of using AI as a differentiator and not homogenator. Thank you. I don't want to go to the rock quarry. <laughs> I'm so scared. Uh, that's where we live, Sam. Uh, on deck, uh, is, is Tanya here? All right, Tanya, you are on deck. And over to you, Paul. All right, thank you. 
Hey there. Uh, this is a wonderful presentation that Jonathan Nalder originally put in, but he couldn't be here, so I got the call a couple of weeks ago to fill in for him. In a nutshell, the opening slide here, as we look at this person looking at a computer screen, lays out the whole situation in the utopian form, where we ask, is this a person who is a high school student preparing for college? Is it a college student who's doing an assignment? Is it somebody in the workplace doing a work assignment? Is it somebody in the workplace doing lifelong learning? And our our utopian proposal here is that it wouldn't matter. It's all of those things because lifelong learning is at the center of this. And our gist of this is we want to encourage ways to find better connections between higher education, formal and informal learning, and what's happening in the workplace worldwide. All right, Sam, oh, there we go. If I hit the right button, it will probably go, but it's not. So I'm not going to worry about the slides. Be <laughs> you got it? I'll worry about that. All right. So, Right now, oftentimes, we are centered on the idea of having achievements. And a lot of people in the room have been talking about that. We had a lot of great conversations last night about what can we do to get past education solely as a event, getting a report card like we saw JFK get. Uh, we're proposing that in the future, this will be a lifelong process. It meets needs for the employees as well as the, the uh, employers. See, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just totally messing up. I need to go back into training for this because I'm not sure where the buttons are on the machine. The gist of what Jonathan wrote in his proposal is that we create a bridge that connects learning into the workplace and workplace learning back into what's going on with our learners. Jonathan is looking at a life where we don't have work starting at a specific age and then at a specific retirement age. We are productive doing the things that contribute to our culture and our society overall. And that would be long term. He's got a framework that we'll be talking about. I believe this is in your packets. We can go past that. There is Jonathan in our neighborhood with me. We're hoping that you'll join us. We'll be, I'm hoping that he's going to be able to come in by a Zoom connection to us this afternoon so Jonathan will be with us demonstrating what we're already doing in our own workplaces to draw people together and knock down these formal walls of learning spaces. There are so many things out there that we all know are resources that we need to be looking at. And there are at least three books that I would recommend if you've got the time. If you're familiar with these, you've got the framework for the conversation we're going to have. Finnish Lessons takes an example from Finland and says, here's one way that this can work. It's not the only way, but it's one. And the other two books are wonderful explorations of where we're at now. So finally, that's us. Um, I'll put the slide deck out for anybody that wants it later. The speaker notes are in there. And I'm hoping that you'll join us across the hall so we can explore this and try to make a difference, creating concrete steps that will create the future of our dreams. Thank you, Paul. And I should also add that Paul and Jonathan are both co-mayors of our Connecting Education to the Workforce of the Future neighborhood. But don't hold that against the neighborhood. It's, it's not its fault. We're going to get a recount going. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah. Over to you, Tanya. All right. I do uh, want to say kudos to Sam and Laura. They're the ones who put this um, originally together as an exemplar, and it was very popular. Um, also, being the mayor of the data group, I was surprised it was popular because we haven't really had too deep of conversations in that group. But since everyone's interested, let's make this happen. Um, I responded to the post at a time when I was just going to South by Southwest and we were talking about learning science. I was attending the LAC conference last week on learning analytics. Um, and so, um, and just was on um, a technology board meeting to talk about the future and, and what we're doing since um, they can't be publishers anymore. So lots of things came up as I was reviewing this and adding in some tweaks. And I think the big thing here when we talk about the utopian view is that we actually use data to solve the world's problems. So we start closing the achievement um, gap. You know, we don't have any more lost Einsteins in this world. Um, no matter um, what group you come from or underrepresented, you have an equal chance of success when you get to higher education. Um, also, we are able to solve the world's problems as far as issues with hunger, um, with homelessness. These are just things I don't understand why we have in this society with all of the technology and intellect that we have. Um, and we also can learn um, to embrace diversity and that we're all equal and we all have similarities rather than focusing on differences in education. And we would do this because we actually would create a culture of ethics around data use. We would open up our data and share this. And this is personal to me because whew, I'm having some problems getting some data sharing going on in my world. And I know a lot of you are as well. Not just within our institution, but across our institutions. We're not only collecting demographic data um, and grade points and grades about our students, but we're actually collecting meaningful behavioral data that's theoretically driven by learning and social theories that are going to actually help us 
predict and understand student success. And there's also a human element to that in that they will not have, you know, computer generated analytical models about the decisions that they make based on data, but they actually would have a human element that would help guide them through that. So that's sort of my um, utopian view, and I'm currently working on this in real life, so please join me for that. The dystopian view, um, also I have attended some international um, events lately. Um, does anybody remember Gattaca from 2007 with Ethan Hawke? That's my dystopian view, right? I just was somewhere where they told me that they're connecting, uh, collecting genetic data on their population in order to predict where they should go in their career, whether it's straight to work or whether it's to college. Um, I think the dystopian view is where we're collecting um, genetic data or different biomedical indicators or biometric indicators of our students. And you know, that Tanya Justin or that JFK that was not doing very well in third grade or eighth grade gets told that you're never going to college because we already know based on your biometric markers and your DNA that you are not on that path based on our computer models, which are invalid measures of actually what a successful person is. Um, it, and I'm not gonna get on grades are like the worstless you know, thing that we have in our lives. But anyways, that's the dystopian view. When we start getting our biometric indicators in it or we start um, not measuring and having invalid measures in our use of technology or our behaviors, and we're doing this right now. There are tech companies that have invalid measures of engagement, and we're using that to try to predict student success, or just doing it off of their um, um, demographic data, and that's really useless. So our models are partial and invalid, and we need to work better to improve those. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a little passionate about this, can you tell? the data neighborhood to join. Oh, you guys thought we were done? That's cool. We actually have one last neighborhood that we ne didn't necessarily plan for in the online community, but I'd like to invite Ruben Pointadora up to talk a little bit about maybe some outliers that we haven't considered yet. All right, so again, morning everyone. Okay. All right, so I want to talk about black swans. Now you may ask, what's a black swan? Well, what is a black swan? Here's a black swan. Thank you very much. We're all set. No, here's the story. Uh, Taleb tells the story of the black swan as the following. Uh, for many, many years, it was thought that only white swans existed. And then, lo and behold, explorers go to Australia and find black swans. And this completely disrupts what you had before, because you had a whole cosmology based upon the only kind of swans that exist are white swans. But now you've got to consider black swans. What do you do with that? Well, you have to completely transform your worldview. You have to completely transform how you're thinking. So this is what Cal talks about when he says we need to think about black swans. Because what drives change in our culture, what drives those events that you say, oh, wow, that's where things happen, most of those turn out to be black swans. And black swan events have three key characteristics. First. You can't predict them ahead of time. If you think you can predict it, congratulations. It is not a black swan. It may be a hard to predict event, but it's not a black swan. Number two, it has a major effect. It's not something that happens and you say, oh, well, who cares? That's it. No, no, no. It has an impact, just like realizing that there exists such a thing as a black swan did in its time. And number three, after it's happened, which you didn't predict, and because you're going reeling at the impact, you can rationalize it retrospectively. You can say, oh, of course, I should have predicted it because of X, Y, and Z after it happened. But remember, you can't do it before. Okay, let's look at one very, very big set of black swans. Say hello to economic crises. You, know, you go from, oh, 1929, 1987, 2008. Each and every one of these is a black swan. Each and every one of these was not predicted. Each and every one of these had a major impact, and each of and every one of these has been rationalized retrospectively, although I would argue not necessarily all that successfully. So these are all examples of black swans. And knowing about one economic crisis did not help us prevent the next economic crisis. No will help us. I'll tell you right now, this is not Cassandraism, okay? There will be another economic crisis that none of these will help us predict. It's also important to note that the different crises are different. For instance, in 1987, the interesting thing about the crisis is it didn't last as a crisis as long as people thought it would. The economy recovered faster. So a black swan can also be something that didn't happen. 
and that's important to keep in mind. All right, so we have black swans. They can't pre pre predict it. They have enormous impact. Let's talk about a couple of black swans in education. So 1937, IBM launches this tool for uh, saving uh, teachers a little bit of time, you know, oh, say then a few bubbles on a sheet, and lo and behold, our automatic grader will grade them for you. It's a black swan. There have been other machines for automatic grading. There have been other attempts to create this type of device, but the whole uh, set of circumstances, contexts, moment come together to suddenly give you our famous bubble in sheet and the number two pencil. And this is a black swan for education. To this day, we live with the consequences of this machine in everything. How many choices do you put on a multiple choice? We know better that it's, it's not always four or five, but guess what? We're used to it from this machine. How should we represent questions? The way we represent them still to this day, the way most teachers tend to default to them, is influenced by this machine. So this is a black swan. We couldn't predict that this particular tool would do it, but not predicted, huge impact, and retroactively you can say, oh yes, because it saved the effort at this point in time and so on. I also said that black swans can be things that didn't happen. So here's an example of something that didn't happen. We all remember the MOOCs when the MOOC was launched. The MOOC is going to change everything. The MOOC is going to transform everything. The MOOC is going to change the conversation. Uh, how's Udacity doing these days? Um, I'll be kind. I won't say very much. But this article just came out about two months ago. And what it does is it does a retrospective analysis to understand why the MOOC was not the MOOC, even as the MOOC has transformed how we talk about things that are MOOC-like. So the MOOC was not a MOOC, but it changed how we talk about things that are kind of like the MOOC, except not. Okay? So that's another example of a black swan in education. That's a black swan that didn't happen. All right. So it'd be great to be able to predict them, but oh, right. We can't. These are black swans. We can't predict black swans. So what do we do instead? Well, we can predict black swans, but we can look for their nesting grounds. And that's what we are going to be doing if you choose to join me in my neighborhood today. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking all those beautiful scenarios that people have come up with, and we're going to be exploring them from the two poles, from utopian optimism and dystopian pessimism. And a little reminder here. Utopia literally means no place. If you can achieve a utopia, it's not a utopia. A utopia should think of almost as an asymptote something that you're approaching. Same thing with a dystopia. That's the really bad side of things. It's not meant that you're ever going to be in a dystopia, okay? Orwell didn't really think you were going to be in 1984 and 1984. But you say, okay, this is as bad as things go. And the nesting grounds are what you get when you explore the place in between. When you look at philosophical optimism, we live in the best of all world possible worlds and everything is as good as it could be. Or philosophical pessimism. Everything is driving towards chaos and disorder and might makes right, etc. Again, these are extremes. You're not talking about living at the extreme. You're talking about processes for exploring the space in between to see what lies. And I decided to you know, do a little tribute here to Voltaire's Candide because Candide is in a certain way a book for it doing just that. It explores as a critique of Leibniz's optimism what happens when you go towards pessimism and yet it's not intended to say everything's bad. It's intended as a place for exploration. So that's what we're going to be doing. And the last thing I want to show you then is one of the tools that we're going to be using, which is when we come up with a synthesis. For those of you who joined the group, when you see how we're going to be working with the scenarios, reaching out to what the other groups are doing and so on, what type of connections are we going to be looking at? Some years back, in the context of the All New Media Consortium, we did an exploration of Black Swans, which was called the Black Swan Ball in the context of the technologies identified at that point by the Horizon Report. And we found that this diagram helped identify two circles, an outer circle that had to do with objects that embedded a certain type of technology in the world, and an inner circle that had to do with networks and connections. And then looking at the connections, not just the internal dystopian, utopian relationships within each one of those, but looking at the utopian, dystopian relationships across them made a huge difference. And just to show you what that's going to look for us today, should you choose to join me in this endeavor, this is a first cut at starting to set up some of these structures in the context of the proposals, in the context of the scenarios that you've heard. So if you like to play with ideas, if you like to ping pong between being very, very happy and very, very unhappy and seeing what emerges to figure out what other questions we should be asking, by all means, come along and join me. Thank you.